stories. When I was in grade school, my family lived in a house that sat directly across the school I attended. However, that was about half a mile of wooded area between them. I was allowed to walk to and from school because it was a straightforward. My mother informed me that she and her siblings walked through the woods to school when they were younger, so it felt like a natural and safe thing for her. I loved the excitement of being able to walk to school all on my own, and I felt pretty at home in the woods as I had been raised around them. The walk was pretty direct with very little issues aside from a small but wide creek that I had to pass. The creek itself was no problem. It was the fact that on each side there was a steep bank that had to be scaled. It wasn't too terrible unless it had been raining. It had rained the day before so my steps, which were normally loud, were fairly silent. This might have saved my life. It at least saved me from something terrible. When I reached the creek, I was in my own little world. I was thinking about a science project we had to do at school and whether or not I was fully prepared for my part in it. I was doing the supernova section and wasn't feeling very ready to make a speech in front of everyone explaining it. Anyway, I reached the creek and dropped down the first bank with a slightly wet thud. I crossed over the water and began looking for something to grab a hold of to pull myself up. There were usually roots sticking out of use. Before I could climb up the other side, I heard a noise like people talking. I stopped and waited to see if I heard it again. I did. I heard a couple of boys talking, getting closer to me. I smashed myself against the bank and listened for a minute. I don't know why, but something just told me to stay away. That something was wrong. The boys came so close, all the way to the edge of the creek bank. But they did not jump down. If they had, they would have seen me in a flash. As luck would have it, there was an overhang I was able to hide under. I listened as the boys talked. Yeah, she comes through here all the time. She should be coming in just a minute. My heart sank. I was the only person that walked this trail, and they were in my direct path. This isn't to say that no one this isn't to say that no one was ever in the woods. But in all the time I used this trail, I'd never seen another person. To get to the woods from my house, I had to cross the road and walk through a small flat area with trees. And from the school side, I had to walk through the school's football field. Anyone from either side could have seen me going in or out of the woods easily. I stood plastered to the wall of mud, waiting for them to catch me. But they walked around a little bit, smoked a couple of cigarettes, and started getting frustrated. Where in the hell is she, man? You said she would be here. So where is she? Maybe she isn't coming to school today. Anyway, we gotta go, or we are going to miss the bus. The high schoolers caught their bus to high school at the elementary school. This told me two things. One, they were obviously in high school, so much older than me. And two, they had some seriously bad intentions toward me. I heard them leaving, but I did not dare move. I waited a good 30 minutes or so before I darted out of the creek bed and toward home. I will never know exactly what those two boys had planned to do to me that day, and I'm not sure I want to. This happened when I was 18 years old and in a deep conflict with where I was going in life and who I was with and who I was. That being said, I tried really hard to have friends and would often overlook a lot of things for the sake of companionship. I was working in a deli at a local co-op and typically worked closing shift. Usually nights were pretty slow and we had a total of five people dispersed around the deli after 9 p.m. One night I was working the deli case when the overnight dishwasher approached me. Tom was about an inch or so taller than me, with greasy hair and a ponytail, and from what my co-worker said, an odor that traveled with him. 
I would often catch him standing in the hallway that led to the dish pit, just staring at me. He stared at me just a little too long after he came up to me and asked if I wanted to get high and watch Monty Python at his place. The fact that I was stoned made me slightly less alarmed and more humored that he stared at me for such long periods of time, but I wasn't interested in doing drugs in a secluded place with someone I barely knew. Being anxious and trying to be polite, I gave him my Facebook instead of my number knowing it would say I was in a relationship and I would not have to blurt it out that I had a boyfriend. He apologized and said he did not know and he would not have asked me out if he did. I said I would be happy to be friends, but I did not feel comfortable going to his house alone when I did not know him that well. He then asked how I was supposed to get to know him at work because he had to stay in the back. We would eventually start to take breaks at the same time we talked a lot about our lives and the heavier things from our past. I talked about my past abuse and he talked about struggling with drug issues and the law. We would sit outside on summer nights while he smoked and I watched the stars and we'd talk about philosophy and our ambitions. We had some very thoughtful conversations, although he seemed a lot more interested in my reactions to what he said than what I said. We also messaged on Facebook frequently. He was overtly sexual and a lot of his topics of conversation but I knew he did not have many friends to talk to, especially about his girlfriend. He occasionally made sexual comments about me, but they were mostly harmless at the beginning. He also would constantly ask me if I found him attractive. When I talked to him about it, he said he had a problem with boundaries and was insecure, but would try harder and that he was sorry. One night we hung out with a group of co-workers after work. He offered to drive me and my co-worker. I accepted because I would not be alone with him, and because parking at my complex became scarce late at night. We met up with other people there and had a decent night. He was conscious about making sure I was comfortable and got me home safely. A week passed without many noteworthy events, but one night my friend and I were at the beach. It must have been around 12 or 1 a.m. when I got a text from Tom asking how to make french fries because he was too drunk. I asked my friend if she wanted to meet him and potentially get french fries and she agreed so we drove over. When we arrived, the stove was on with nothing on it. He was stumbling all over and his girlfriend was drunk and naked in the other room. He said he wanted to go to the beach too and drive to get french fries so we took him to get food and go to the beach with us Tom spent the whole night asking how kinky I was, if I had ever gotten a rim job, and saying that he imagined bending me over the salad bar and saying what else he wanted to do to me. I drove him home and brushed it off, yet again assuming it was more the alcohol than him. He then progressively got worse. During one of our chats, he casually mentioned he could kill someone and feel nothing. He would flick his tongue at me when I walked by and said he wanted to change his tongue piercing to a vibrator. He would tell me what he was into and claim it was friendly and platonic and he was not interested in me at all. Now I know what you are thinking but sadly I'm just as naive as the dumb person in horror movies that yell hello and walk into the darkness looking for answers. However this is where it all starts to click in my head. Our mutual friend and co-worker Scott overheard me talking to my friend about how everything I explained how Tom is crossing a line. Tom simply apologizes and keeps doing said creepy thing. Scott looked at me and asked, are you talking about Tom? Slightly ashamed. I said yes. Scott pulls me aside and tells me in a hushed voice that Tom wanted to hang out and Scott had immediately forgotten and took a shower. When he got out of the shower, Tom was just sitting in his house waiting for him. Scott and I kept our distance from him outside of work, but made occasional small talk while we worked with him. I remained unnerved that he knew where I lived. I remained unnerved every night when I covered the salad bar and could feel a gaze. About a week or so later, he got a new girlfriend and his harassment died down a little. It was less verbal 
and more just strange looks and staring at me. When I offered one of my male co-workers a ride home, Tom stared at me the whole rest of the night until we left. A different night, I gave another one of my male co-workers my number and told him we should hang out sometime. Sometime after that, I was in the back gathering supplies to stock the espresso bar, and Tom came up to me and cornered me. He started asking why I gave my co-worker my number and asking if I wanted to have sex with him. I politely responded that it was friendly and pushed him back. I could always feel him watching me. About a night later, I was talking to that same co-worker when Tom interjected and said, and I quote, Do you know what the difference between sexual harassment and what I do to you is? That was the last straw that broke the camel's back and I reported it to management and blocked him the next day. He was talked to and told he could not talk to me at work unless it was about work and work only. Management decided it was a good plan against my wishes to have this talk right before we started our shift together. Scott ended up coming in and standing by to make sure nothing happened. He claimed he had no clue why I reported him and called me a bitch to our mutual friends. He also quit about a week later because there were too many dishes. Thanks for the nightmares of bringing up past trauma I told you about, Tom. This happened when I first started university. My first day moving into student hall, I was greeted by a very friendly guy called Dominic. He was very camp and told me he was gay early in the conversation, but I didn't have a problem with that. He offered to help me unpack in my room, then go for a drink with me. Although I thought this was a little over familiar, I was delighted that I had made a new friend so quickly and accepted his offer. He put a tremendous amount of effort in helping me put everything in the appropriate place in my room. We then went for a drink at the student bar. I made a point to tell him I was straight, as I suspected he might have a bit of a crush on me, hence why he was being so nice. However, he didn't show any signs of dismay and continued chatting to me. I liked him a lot. He was very intelligent and interesting to talk to. I was very pleased that I had a new friend already. I was worried that I'd be lonely in the uni dorms. He didn't live in the same building as me. He just lived across. I was studying creative writing and he was studying business, but we started to hang out a lot. Although I liked Dominic, I did start to find him a little overbearing. He would send me texts and messages on Facebook all the time and he would get upset if I did not reply, even if it went only for about five minutes. He would always want to know what I was doing, and if I disappeared off Facebook for a while, he would want to know where I'd been all day. One time, I even sent him a text mentioning I was on a train, and he texted me back, Why are you on a train? Why am I not invited to wherever you are going? I made quite a few friends and he would always show visible signs of displeasure whenever they were around and whenever I talked to him about them he would tell me he disliked them and that I shouldn't trust them. He was very possessive and I personally can't stand clingy friends. So I tried to distance myself from him a bit but the more I pulled away the tighter he held. I still hung out with him and still cared about him but I was starting to worry about where this friendship was going. I was pretty sure that this guy had a crush on me, and soon my suspicions were confirmed. I met this girl at a party that I went to called Anna and asked her on a date. She accepted. I was really thrilled and told Dominic about it. The second I told him, his face fell. Why are you going on a date with her? He asked, sounding very worried. Uh, because I want to, I said. But I'm going to be jealous, he said. Please don't go. It'll really hurt me. You wouldn't want to hurt me. I'm your best friend. I had never actually told him he was my best friend before, and I found the way he was acting now both annoying and a little creepy. I'm sorry, but I told you that I was straight before, Dominic, I said. We can still be friends, but I'm not going to stop dating just for you. He remained sulky and miserable the rest of the night. 
I told myself that he'd have to accept it or get over it. But when I was on the date with Anna, I kept getting phone calls from unknown numbers. I answered first, but I couldn't hear anything on the other end. It was just as though someone was listening. I started to ignore the calls, but you would not believe how frequently they were coming in. They were coming in non-stop, and I couldn't even tell the time because they seriously would not stop. I had to put my phone on airplane mode. After about an hour of my phone in airplane mode, I switched airplane mode off. But the very second I did, the calls came in again. Although I was unnerved, I enjoyed my date with Anna, and we agreed to meet up again. When I got home from the date, Dominic was waiting, right outside my dorm, his phone in his hand. Anna had no mutual connections with Dominic, so I asked him how he could possibly know about this. He just told me he had done his research. I was angered and told him it was none of his business and that I'd find out myself. He started crying, saying how he was just worried about me and stormed off. I think he was hoping that I'd follow him, but I didn't. And when I went to my room, angry that he would try to interfere with my life like this, I've had unrequited crushes on friends before, but if they don't feel the same, I never try to force it, but Dominic only got worse. When I got back to my student room, Dominic had sent me screenshots on Facebook of a conversation he allegedly had with Anna. The messages showed her boasting to him about how she was using me and how she was planning to break my heart. Obviously, this didn't ring at all true, as one, how would she even know who Dominic was and why would she message him? And two, why would she tell a friend of mine so openly what her plans for me were? when he would obviously show me. I demanded that he show me the conversation from Anna on his computer screen with me there, but he told me that he had deleted the conversation because they were too upsetting for him to read. I knew right then and there that Dominic was deliberately trying to ruin my relationship with Anna through incredibly deceitful and despicable means, and I told him that I wasn't interested in him, that I would never be, and that he'd better stop right now. He told me that I was being a terrible friend, that all he was trying to do was look out for me, and that he could not believe that I was believing a stranger over him. I was seriously pissed off with the way he was selfishly trying to manipulate me now and blocked him on social media. He started sending me constant texts and calling me nonstop every day, telling me things like he was so depressed over me and that he had started taking heroin and that he was contemplating suicide basically trying to make me worry. He would also constantly send me texts saying he knew Anna was cheating on me and that I had to come to my senses. He was creeping me out so much that I went to stay with my parents for a bit as I wasn't comfortable living in the same area as him. I had to block his number because the phone calls were so constant. People from my uni dorm were sending me angry messages because Dominic had told them a really twisted version of what was going on, making them think that Anna was a dirty, STD-ridden whore who I had betrayed him for. It then turned out that he had been lying to everyone, telling them that me and him were in a romantic sexual relationship and that I had cheated on him with Anna, then left him for her. I furiously set everyone straight told them that I had never been in a relationship with Dominic and that everything he had told them about Anna was bullshit. Most people believed me, although it took a while to convince everyone that Dominic was the liar. He was very manipulative, and although a lot of his lies were ludicrous, he was very good at making himself sound legit. I decided to go back to my uni dorm after a while, as it was inconvenient for me to stay at my parents' house while at uni. Their house was far away from it. I arrived back there quite late, as I really did not want to run into Dominic. I was so angry about him. I had a new girlfriend and studies to think about. Yet because of his obsession and harassment, he was now all I could think about. In a very twisted way, I think this is what he really wanted. Positively or negatively, he wanted me thinking about him. When I got back, I just laid down on my bed, thinking about what to do when suddenly, smash, a brick came flying through my window. I jumped a mile and rolled over the side of my bed, hiding, thinking it was burglars coming in or something, but nothing more happened. 
but once I got over the shock, I cautiously stepped over the broken glass and tried to look out the window. When I got a phone call off of a number I did not recognize, I answered it, and it was Dominic, and you will not believe what he said. I just saw Anna throw a brick through your window and run, he shouted. I told you she was bad news. You should have listened to me. I told you. You would not believe the rage I felt. I was so angry I could not even speak for a moment. But then I just exploded. I screamed at him that I knew it was him. And I was calling the police right now. He tried to protest, but I hung up on him and immediately called them. When they arrived, Dominic was not in his room. But when it was opened up, a large stash of illegal drugs was found there. The manager of my student halls assured me that he'd be getting kicked out for this, and the police said they would be getting in touch with him. After this, I never saw Dominic again. I changed my phone number and never unblocked him on social media. A couple times I was tempted to out of sheer curiosity, but decided it wasn't worth it. I think he dropped out of the uni, but I don't know exactly what happened to him. My relationship with Anna didn't last. She was never quite clear on why she ended it but I actually suspect that Dominic's freakish behavior scared her off. Even though it wasn't my fault, oh well, life goes on. Dominic, I hope whatever issues you're going through, you sort them out. And I hope that you find a guy who actually does want to be with you. Okay, here we go. I moved in. A new apartment last April. This was my first time having a place all to myself. So I was stoked. As soon as I move in, I notice the place smells like cigarettes. Maybe it's from the previous resident. So I buy some plug-ins and assume it will dissipate. A week later, I'm still dealing with the smell. I'm a relatively petite 20-something woman, so I don't make a habit. I'm knocking on random doors. Anyway, this guy answers. I ask if he's smoking cigarettes inside and explain why I need it to stop. He's super forward with me immediately kissing my hand and asks if I'm single. I tell him I am seeing someone and he says to let him know if it doesn't work out. All's fine for a week. Then the smell creeps in again. I start getting very pissed off and text the neighbor. He's all apologetic. Says his friend was at his apartment while he was at work and forgot to tell him the rules. Who are these people with zero home training? Turns out the neighbor had been homeless for a time and lets his still homeless friend crash with him. I'm initially sympathetic, but only to the extent because they are fucking with my health. I also work from home, so there's basically no escape from the toxic smoke. Fast forward a few months and I haven't had to deal with anything. Hadn't even seen the neighbor for a while. Assumed he moved, and I was happy about it. Then he suddenly pops back up, knocks on my door to tell me, this stupid story about how he got arrested while on the local college campus because he looked like this guy who was stalking a female student and had to sit in jail for three months. Now I'm not stupid, so I took all that with a grain of salt. Also years prior to this, the guy had apparently been in a car accident, suffered a traumatic brain injury, and is autistic because of it. This kind of explains why he seems to not understand normal boundaries or pick up on nonverbal communication. Now he's making a habit of knocking on my door at random times to ask me to drive him places or if my boyfriend and I want to go ice skating with him. This drives me insane because I work from home and I just hate unannounced visitors. But this guy lives directly behind me, knows what car I drive, my boyfriend drives, and is familiar with my dog, so I hesitate telling him to leave me alone. February, he gets arrested again on campus on Valentine's Day. While he's in jail for three months, his homeless friends 
realize his apartment is empty and unlocked, so they have a free place to stay, a free place to chain smoke, and make my life miserable. I call management multiple times and they completely brush me off. I'm sick, unable to work enough, pretty much irrationally angry at this point, so I start knocking and telling these people they have to stop. At one point I go over there, talk to a woman I don't recognize at all, and notice a massive tent in the living room. There's basically a homeless camp in the apartment next to me. After going over there twice in a day, because the smoke was so bad, I lose it at these people, my boyfriend with me, so I hold nothing back, screaming, crying, stomping around, telling them they have got to stop fucking with my life like this. Thankfully, my boyfriend knew the two people that were there while I was on my triad. We look up their criminal records, not pretty. B and E's, petty theft, possession of methamphetamine, great. Now I realize why they insist on smoking cigarettes inside. Probably to cover the smell of something far sinister. Yeah, you wouldn't know that unless you actually smoke crystal meth yourself. No surprise, I'm going insane. Fast forward to May, he's out of jail again and back apologizing to me. Leaves me a stupid note and a fake plan to say he's sorry. I stop answering the door if my boyfriend is not home because I don't want to deal with his stupid ass anymore. Finally, at the end of May, he moves out. Management puts up a notice on the door saying, no trespassing, police will be called immediately if anyone is seen entering or exiting this unit. My nightmare is finally over.